Hi everyone and welcome to this week's Brain Coach Tips. I'm Jan Bedell, otherwise known as the Little Giant Steps Brain Coach. I'm privileged to be here to share the revelations God has given me. You know, over the past 20 years, I have walked with many different families on their journey to help their children be all that they were designed to be. I assume that's why you're here as well, so welcome. Hey, can you do me a favor and share the link to this podcast with others so more families can get the help that they are praying for? We both thank you. Last week, we talked a lot about learning styles and how that has become so prevalent and our view as a neurodevelopmentalist of how it's important to be good in all the learning areas and have all those learning channels working well because there's certain information that needs to come in certain ways. Today, we're going to talk about what if there's a deficit in one area or the other and how to shore up those areas of inefficiencies where the information can flow freely through the auditory, the visual, and the tactile system. Let's start with the tactile system today. If they have a poor visual or auditory channels that are not working too well, then they're probably going to be a tactile learner. In my opinion, this is the most inefficient way to learn because if you have to touch it, it's really hard to get all that information in that you could just glance at, look at, or hear about. But the tactile system is very important too. Some information, it comes in best through that system. Let's take geology or botany, for instance. It's much more efficient to take in information when you can feel the leaves and you can look at the spines on the, on the cactus and actually feel them. That information is best coming in tactily. There's other things that need to come in that way as well. So if this is a challenge, what do we need to do? If someone is hypersensitive to touch, then it's hard for them to bring in information through the tactile channel. They don't like feeling grass on their feet or different textures of clothing drive them crazy. This can also be very distracting for them. So you can do something called tactile stimulation where you get a glove. We call it a tactile glove. It's really like one of those bath exfoliating gloves. And you can lightly touch on the arms and legs and just rub them very lightly, stimulating those surface receptors that go to the brain to give the information correctly to the brain. What's happening when they're hypersensitive is that their brain is kind of shorting out and saying this is painful when it's really shouldn't be painful. What we're talking about is stimulating the brain so that it works better. Now these people that are tactile, they're usually better with their coordination and their perception of where you are in space. And obviously you can see that's very important to have as well. Let me give you an example of how this may play out negatively in a person's life. And if they don't have this good information coming in tactily, it can reduce the abilities that they have to do things. And it could be even perceived as behavioral because, you know, it's a simple task. Say folding towels. You know, you would think anybody could fold a towel, right? Well, I tried to teach my daughter to fold towels. And she just could not do it. It was a mangled mess all the time. Fortunately, I found out about the neurodevelopmental approach and the plasticity of the brain. That means if the brain is stimulated, it's going to grow and change and function is going to happen. So you've got 3% cell bodies in your brain. 97% of your brain is connections. And when the brain is stimulated, whether it's auditory, visual, or tactile, it's going to make connections that bring function. So as we work on stimulating these areas, like I would just press on her arms and press on her legs about one minute on each limb. And in about six weeks, she surprised me by being able to fold towels. Obviously she knew how to fold towels. Now she could move her body through space because her brain was more connected to her limbs. These kinds of things can be remediated just by stimulating the brain. Let's take the visual system now. There's certain information that's better that comes in visually. In my opinion, if you have math operations like long division or multi-step multiplication like with more than one multiplier, or you have algebra equations, those are better coming in visually. It's gonna be hard to 
feel those. So it's good to work on the different aspects of the visual system. One of those is visual sequential processing. This is holding visual pieces of information in sequential order so that, in other words, you can remember them in the order that you saw them. There's a test on the littlegiantsteps.com website that will help you figure out where your child is on visual sequential processing. A four-year-old should be able to do four pieces, hold four pieces together, and a five-year-old, five pieces. A six-year-old, six, and a seven-year-old, or anyone older than seven, should be able to hold seven pieces of visual information together. If this is a deficit, they may not want to use their visual for taking in information, but this is something that can easily change. You get that test, and then they will teach you about doing digit cards twice a day for two minutes. Real simple little exercise that you can do to help strengthen this area of weakness or accelerate it if they're doing well here. The examples of how this benefits you is you can take in large chunks of information when you're reading so it speeds up their reading and just in general looking in your environment taking in information visually, that would just be like a sponge taking that information in. So visual sequential processing is one area. Visual discrimination is another area that's very important to foster. Visual discrimination is when you can tell the difference in two very similar things, like the two words hat and bat. Those are very similar words. So this visual discrimination game that we have on our website, you can look at that. Level one is something very easy. Three numbers that look similar, but there's 12 cards that have different combinations of those three. They have to look at one card and find the match to it very quickly. It goes from something so simple as that to larger sequences of numbers to words that are very similar that start with the same two or three letters to symbols that make it very difficult. And with this visual discrimination game, you can also add visual memory. So you just show it to them for a few seconds. Then they have to remember and discriminate. So it's a really good resource. One girl that was working with us had a great example of how this helped her. When she could perceive and take in lots of visual information and discriminate quickly, she could tell when she was playing hockey, much before her opponents, what was going to happen. So she could see, take in that information, see their movements, and see whether she needed to move one place or the other and actually make a real difference in her game because she could see those things far ahead. Another area of the visual system that you need to be aware of, and I talked a little bit about this last week was the eye dominance. That means the eye that's taking in the information to store it. You see with both eyes, but you actually store information with one particular eye. This is called your dominant eye. If you're right-handed, you should be right-eyed. If you're left-handed, you should be left-eyed. Now what happens when you do that test that I was talking about last week and you find out the child's using the wrong eye? That means their visual long-term memory will be not as good as you would like to have it. That may not be the learning channel that they're going to want to use because it's not working as efficiently. You can actually change this by patching the eye for about four hours every day. It doesn't have to be four consecutive hours. It's just any four hours. Now before you do that, you just have to do this quick test to make sure that the eyes are working together and there's not a weak eye because there's no detriment of actually switching the eye. There's only positive really to covering the eye unless there's a weak eye. So what I want you to do is take something that they'll look at, some fun object, and hold it out about 18 inches from the bridge of their nose. You're going to bring that object in slowly to about two and a half inches and ask them to watch that as it comes in. Then you're going to go back out to 18 inches. That's about arm's length. And then you're going to do a little bit of horizontal and vertical tracking. As you do this, you're going to retrace a little bit so that they're not just anticipating where you, 
you're going to go and moving their eyes that direction, they're actually staying with you. Then come in again, do a little horizontal vertical tracking, come in again. Do that for about two minutes so that you're tiring the eyes. And as long as you see both eyes coming in together smoothly and coming back out, it's fine to do that um, occluding, which means patching one of the eyes, which is opposite to the hand that they're using. So if they're right-handed, you're going to occlude the left eye. Now, if you would like to take a survey on our website, littlegiantsteps.com, you can just go to littlegiantsteps.com and forward slash survey. It will take you right to that spot and put in information there to get some individualized recommendations. That's something that a lot of people like to do just to get some help of, on where to start. So I'd encourage you to try that. Now looking at the auditory system, some kids may avoid auditory because they have some confusion there. We call this tonal processing issues. One of my clients said, I knew I had a problem when my daughter said, what do you mean a purple cow's on the roof? Well, that's what she heard, but that's not what they said. She was convinced that that's what she said, and she kept asking them, what do you mean by that? Well, they hadn't said that. So you can see how if information is not coming in well, they're not going to choose that channel. But again, a lot of auditory information is best coming in through your auditory system. Another challenge in auditory is if they're hypersensitive, that sounds bother them. And Sometimes they just turn off their auditory system. There's a lot that needs to come in through this auditory channel, especially when the individuals are in upper grades or in college when they have to take in information through lectures. So something that you can do is get some really good headphones. Get the best ones that you can afford that have the highest range of ohms and hertz. And listen to Mozart a couple of times a day for about 15 minutes. This will actually stimulate the auditory nerve and help normalize that tonal processing and the hypersensitivity. The other thing you need to do is work on that auditory sequential processing, holding those auditory pieces together. This can help with their phonics, their comprehension, following directions, many, many things. We've talked about this several times, so I just can't emphasize enough how important that is. Again, there's a test kit that you can get on the website, littlegiantsteps.com, test and see where they are, work on this skill. Why would they need this auditory sequential processing? Well, let me give you an example. I don't know if you listen to any of the debates, but when Ted Cruz was doing his debate, he had such good auditory memory that he could remember the whole series of things that people had talked about you know, several different people had talked about, and he was able to hold that and bring it up. So you can see how that would be a huge benefit to someone that wants to be a lawyer. Even if you just want to be successful in life, you need good auditory processing to hold what people are saying and then be able to act on that. The other thing we talked about is the ear dominance. Which ear is the information coming in to be stored? And I just wanted to remind you that plugging an ear with an ear plug, like the swimmer's kind, or you can get an ear mold made at an audiologist even, that will help tell the brain, oh, this isn't working too well, I've got to use the other one, and switch over. Unfortunately, it takes some time for that dominance to switch. Both eye and ear typically take about a year. So you have to be consistent. That earplug needs to stay in all waking hours, and that eye patch is about four hours. Remember that the dominance follows the hand. So if the child is still mixed-handed, you probably want to seek some professional help like we offer as neurodevelopmentalists at Little Giant Steps. I'd like to share with you a note that we got from one of our former clients. The mom writes, to say my son's handwriting was bad is to put it mildly. It was, to borrow from Judith Byrst, terrible, horrible, no good, very bad handwriting, which breaks my heart to say because he tried so very hard. It's as if his hand just didn't work right. We tried everything to help him. We bought handwriting workbooks. We tried copy work. We quickly gave up on dictation. It seemed that everything we tried only added to Jake's frustration. And the more we practiced, the worse it got. We couldn't understand why this was so difficult. For years, I kept thinking things like, 
At least it can't get any worse. Or, he's just a boy and all boys have bad handwriting, right? Or, there's always typing. It was such a source of frustration that we had all but given up. And then we found little giant steps. Jan would teach us about mixed dominance and its effect upon motor control. We began doing the specific exercises and Jake began to make steady improvement in all areas. We were so hopeful, but something still wasn't quite right. After about a year, Jan noticed Jake was regressing. Thanks to her experience, she recognized the cause immediately. Despite what we all thought, Jake included, he wasn't right-handed after all. He was a lefty. It has taken us a while and a lot of work, but he is making amazing progress. We just started cursive this week. He's gone from hating handwriting to enjoying it. No more complaining when I pull out the handwriting sheets. No more tears and frustration. Thank you, Little Giant Steps. That just gives you some idea how some families are struggling when the child is having poor handwriting. Now, not all handwriting has to do with a dominant hand being used the wrong way. For tips for handwriting, you can go to littlegiantsteps.com forward slash handwriting and it will take you directly to an article that we wrote on how to help the muscles be better so that handwriting can be easier. You might also check out the Cursive Logic that we have on our store. Cursive Logic is a great way to teach cursive writing. It makes a lot of sense. With four different strokes, you can teach all the letters of the alphabet. So check out Cursive Logic on the Little Giant Step store and see if that wouldn't be something that could really help your situation. Try some of those handwriting tips to help those muscles work better and you'll have an easier time. I haven't mentioned the foot because it's the least as far as the dominance and you don't really take in much information that way. It's not part of most of the learning that you do, but just to make sure that you understand about how to influence the dominance of the foot, you want to have them kick and hop on that foot that lines up with their hand. So if they're right-handed, you want them to hop and kick mostly with the right foot. That's all the time we have now for this topic. My prayer is that this important information encourage you to stay tuned for more Brain Coach tips to make life and learning easier. Next week, we'll be exploring the topic, different ways each individual on the planet can be smart. For now, it's the Brain Coach signing off and reminding you that neurodevelopment is a dynamic approach to life. So think differently. The solution is not in the problem.